Our Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to the Easter service of Park Street Baptist Church for April 12, 2020. We are located in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. My name is David Richardson. Andrew Harbridge is our Minister of Music. Sylvie Copland is our reader and will also be playing the children's song. Diane Richardson will tell the children's story. Malcolm Copland is our technician and will also be praying at the Lord's table. Praise the Lord. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for all your goodness. We thank you that your love toward us is forever. We ask that you would help us to worship and to praise you. We ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, I'll turn the service over to Andrew. Good morning, church. Christ is risen. Let's join together and sing this great hymn of the faith by Charles Wesley, Christ the Lord is risen today. First reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 18 to 22. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Amen. What better time than Easter time to sing John 3.16, a beloved verse of the Christian faith. So join together as we sing God So Loved.
The second reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day, rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This is the word of God. When I was choosing this next hymn, I was reminded of a certain lady who is perhaps one of the kindest people that I have ever met. She faithfully served the Lord over her lifetime, and she served in the choir for over 65 years. She made it known to me on several occasions that this number was her favorite gospel song. If you haven't already guessed, this lady was Edna Rankin, who went to be with her Lord a few years ago. I invite you now to meditate on the meaningful words of Edna's favorite song, Because He Lives. Our next worship song is the children's song led by Sylvie Copland, and the Bible story is by Diane Richardson.
Thank you, Sylvie. Good morning, children. Do you know what today is? That's right, it is Easter. We often say to one another, He is risen. He is risen indeed. We just sang, He came from heaven to earth to show the way, from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Jesus came to earth to teach us the way to live. He went to the cross and died to take away our sins. And he rose from the grave and went up to heaven to show us he is God, and he is stronger than Satan and evil. Jesus is able to take away our fears, if we ask him. He is able to help us when we don't know what to do, and we can go to him and pray any time, because he is in heaven, but also in our hearts. When we trust in Jesus and obey him, he shows us how to live and helps us do what is right. Isn't that wonderful? Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you love us, and we thank you for the children. Thank you that you know each one of them by name. And Lord, right now I'm thinking about somebody with the with the name that begins with A, someone who begins with the letter B, and someone who begins with the letter C. Lord, you know all about them. You know if they've had a good week, if they've had some sad times, if they're afraid of anything. Lord, I pray that you'd help them especially and comfort them. Father, I pray that when we think of Easter today, we would be filled with joy because of what you did for us, and that because of that, we can come to you any time and talk to you. You take away our tears, you comfort us, and you help us. And we thank you. Bless the children this week, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Diane. Let us pray. Our Father, we come before you this morning with gratitude. We think particularly this Easter morning of the wonder that you raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We thank you for this proof that he is your Son. We thank you for this proof that you will one day raise us again from the dead. In this time when so many fear death, we thank you that death is not the end. We thank you that we will one day live with you forever. We confess our sins to you. We ask your forgiveness. We want to live above sin, and so we ask that you would grant us that resurrection power so that we might live our lives in a way that is pleasing to you. We bring before you each one who needs a special touch from your hand. Protect us also from this virus, we pray. Give us wisdom as we live in our homes and carefully go out to do the things we need to do. We ask that you would give the board wisdom in all their decisions. We ask that you would bless each one involved in preparing this service. And now we ask that you would open your word to us. Help us to understand the significance of Jesus' resurrection. In his name we pray. Amen. Last week we left the women waiting for the end of the Sabbath. Their plan was to go to the tomb and to put the spices they'd prepared on the body of Jesus. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. It was now early Sunday morning. The women, who knew for a fact that Jesus had died, who had seen him die, came to anoint his body. In his Gospel, Mark mentions their discussion on the way to the tomb, about how they would manage to move the large stone so they could minister to the body of Jesus. Imagine their surprise. When they got there, the stone was no longer covering the entrance to the tomb. When they went in, his body was missing. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. 
And as they were frightened and bowed their, bowed their faces to the ground, the man said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? They were perplexed indeed. Had Joseph of Arimathea changed his mind? Had Pilate changed his mind? Had the spiritual leaders of the people raided the tomb? I'm not saying that these were the thoughts going through their minds. We aren't told. But these women were a lot like you and I. Almost anything they could think of as a reason for the grave to be open and empty would be easier for them to believe than the truth. Then two men appeared wearing dazzling clothing. The women bowed down before them, which tells us that they knew the men were angels. And the angels asked the women why they were looking for Jesus in a grave. He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. The angels didn't say that the women had the wrong tomb. They didn't say that someone had taken his body to be reburied elsewhere. They said that Jesus had risen from the dead. Then they reminded the women that Jesus had said, in Luke 9, that he would be crucified and that he would rise from the dead. That was an extraordinary prediction at the time he made it, and puzzling. They probably didn't take it literally. But Jesus had told them so that when it happened, they would remember. Oh, right, he did say that. Most of us are probably aware that in the culture of Jesus' day, women were often in a background role. So in my opinion, whenever Scripture puts women in the foreground, we need to take note. These were women from among his following. They are seldom mentioned in the Gospels, but according to the angels, they were expected to have listened to the words of Jesus, to have understood what he said, and to have remembered his words when they saw the empty tomb. They had a responsibility to know what Jesus said and to expect his resurrection. They themselves were expected to believe. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. There were at least five women telling the disciples that Jesus was risen, so why did the disciples think it was no more than an idle tale? Let's remember that the disciples did not yet believe. To them it seemed more reasonable to assume that the women were talking nonsense. That was easier to believe than the truth that Jesus was risen. But they too should have remembered, especially when the women told them of the angel's reminder. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter was still carrying the guilt of having denied Jesus, but his personality hadn't changed. He was still impetuous. He couldn't rest without checking out the women's story. He had to see for himself what had happened. What he found was surprising and thought-provoking. The women were right. Jesus really had risen. That very day two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. These two were in conversation about all these things, which would include the events of the betrayal and arrest and trial and crucifixion of Jesus, and the events that had already happened that first Easter morning. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. 
Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? The fact that they were sad tells us that they didn't yet believe that Jesus had risen. Over a week ago, I was in a food store and got chatting with the clerk. Our conversation soon turned to the coronavirus, and she named off two or three people she knew who had it or who had died from it. In these days, it's no surprise to find people in conversation about the coronavirus. It weighs on our minds. It was the crucifixion of Jesus that weighed on the minds of Cleopas and his companion. In his three years of ministry, Jesus had become well known. His crucifixion by the Romans was a newsworthy event, so much so that Cleopas assumed that even a visitor to Jerusalem would have heard what had happened. And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. I find it interesting that they called him Jesus of Nazareth. They would eventually call him Jesus Christ, meaning Jesus the Messiah. But not at this moment. Rather, they described him as almost anyone else would. Which Jesus? Jesus from Nazareth. They went on to describe Jesus as a prophet. Remember that they didn't yet believe in the resurrection. Therefore, they assumed he was dead. Therefore, he couldn't have been the Messiah. But they knew that he was a spokesman for God, so they called him a prophet. The mighty deeds he referred to would be the miracles that Jesus did. But they also recognized that there was something very powerful in the words that Jesus spoke. He spoke the truth. He spoke with wisdom. He spoke with authority. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him? But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Notice that they blamed the chief priests and elders for his crucifixion. And that's accurate. Judas and Pilate were also to blame, of course. But the religious and spiritual leaders of the people had conspired to have the Messiah crucified. These two men were sad, not just because Jesus was a good friend who had been executed by the Romans. These followers of Jesus had hoped that Jesus would be the one to redeem Israel, meaning they had hoped that Jesus would be the Messiah. These events were still fresh in their hearts, but since it was the third day, they had come to accept the reality of his death. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Notice they described their reaction as amazement. Initially, their reaction was disbelief. It was just an idle tale. But as they thought through what the women had said, it was an amazing account. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it to be just as the women had said, but him they did not see. They knew that the women didn't find the body, that the women saw angels, and that the angels told the women that Jesus was alive. They also knew that the disciples who went to check found it empty. Notice they had all these facts, but they had stopped short of believing that Jesus had risen. Let's be careful that this doesn't happen to us. We have the scriptures. We have the facts. Let's not stop short of believing what we read. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That must have been some Bible study. Jesus expected them to know and to believe what the prophets had taught about himself. And what they didn't know or didn't understand, he explained to them. 
So as they drew near to the village to which they were going, he acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. While he was at table with them, he took the bread, and blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? We don't have Jesus talking to us, rebuking us, teaching us in person. But we have his word and we do have the Holy Spirit. So the question for us is this. Do our hearts ever burn within us? Let's make it our prayer that God would speak to us through his word. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Both groups had something to share. Simon Peter had seen the Lord, and so had these men traveling to Emmaus. That must have been an interesting conversation. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? They've just discussed two encounters with Jesus, but that left many who hadn't yet seen him. It's one thing to be told by someone else, it's another to see for yourself. So they didn't yet believe, and they thought they were seeing a spirit, a ghost. See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself? Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Jesus gave them proof that he wasn't a disembodied spirit, a ghost. He invited them to touch him, and then they watched him eat some fish. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The New Testament hadn't been written, of course, So Jesus was referring to the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible contains the books that we find in the Old Testament, only grouped somewhat differently. Most of the Old Testament is included in these, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. In effect, Jesus was saying that the Old Testament speaks about him, and he was saying that his crucifixion and resurrection were predicted in the Old Testament. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And what was the message that would be proclaimed? That in the name of Jesus, the crucified and risen Jesus, that in his name, Repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached. Do we see here the connection between repentance and forgiveness of sins? Repentance requires that we admit that we have sinned, because we can only repent of things that we acknowledge that we have done. But repentance means a turning away from these things. We have to go in a different direction. Some sins require a complete 180 degree turn. We must turn toward God instead of toward whatever sin we've been involved in. And where would this message of forgiveness be preached? It would be preached to all nations. 
it would begin in Jerusalem, but it would be for everyone. Everyone, including you and me. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus was sending them to do this task, the task of preaching the word to the world, because they were witnesses. They were first-hand observers of these events. But then Jesus added that they were to stay in the city until they had been clothed with power, power from on high, power from God. He described it as the promise of his Father. It was the Holy Spirit who had been promised to them. Jesus had told them that they would be given the gift of the Holy Spirit after he had left them. So they were to wait for him and wait for his power. This power would be practical. In the struggle against sin, they would need the power of God. To spread the gospel, they would need the power of God. To conquer the forces of darkness for the kingdom, they would need the power of God. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them, and was carried up into heaven. That would have been something to see, Jesus lifting up his hands in blessing, while rising into the sky. And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, blessing God. Jesus deserves our worship. To be Christian is to recognize that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, one with the Father. This means that worshiping other persons or things is sinful, whether that person is another god, or a star of the screen or stage, or the person that we are in a relationship with. It doesn't matter. We are to worship Jesus. Nor are we to worship power or position or pleasure. We aren't to worship material goods or money. It doesn't matter what it is. Jesus must come first. Imagine the disciples' joy. Jesus was alive. And they had a job to do, to tell the world the good news that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. They went into the temple to bless God. They didn't yet understand but God was about to change the meeting place. Soon they, the disciples themselves, would become the temple of God. Soon believers, the church, would be God's temple. But that required the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And that wouldn't happen until Pentecost. So in the meantime, they went into the only temple they had to praise God. What's the significance of the resurrection? I want to draw your attention to three things. First, in Romans 1 we read that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. The disciples weren't gullible, nor were the women who had followed Jesus. It wasn't easy for them to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. But they saw him, they walked, and talked with him, they ate with him, and he taught them. And when they realized that he had truly been raised from the dead, they understood that he was indeed the Son of God. Second, in John's vision, in Revelation 1, he writes that Jesus said, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. The resurrection proves that Jesus has the power over physical death. We don't know when we will die, or if Christ will return first. But we do know this. Jesus is alive, and he has the keys, or the control, over death and the grave. The disciples knew without a doubt that when Jesus promised eternal life, he meant it. When they were promised resurrection in the last day, Jesus could do it. And so the resurrection gave them, and gives us, hope for the future. Third, in Romans 6 we read that, Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory 
of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We were dead spiritually before we trusted Jesus, but we have been made alive in Christ by the power of the resurrection. We speak of our new spiritual life in Christ as being born again. That happens once. But we live and grow day by day. We need power over sin and temptation day by day. Just as Jesus was raised by God's power, by that same power, we too can have new life in Him. We can live holy lives day by day. Let us pray. Our Father, we give you thanks for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Thank you for the hope that we have because Jesus Christ has conquered death and the grave. We thank you also that he has given us power to live godly lives, holy lives. We ask that we may use that power day by day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join in and sing, Christ Arose. At this time, I would invite those of you who know Jesus Christ personally as Savior and Lord to join us at the Lord's table. Please pause this recording while you bring out bread and fruit of the vine and then quietly examine your heart before God, asking forgiveness for any sin he brings to mind. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At this time, I would ask Malcolm Copland to give thanks for both the bread and the cup, which represent Jesus' body and his blood, sacrificed for us. Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather around your table in our homes. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us, for your 
broken body and for the shed blood, for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. Help us once again to contemplate upon your sacrifice and what that cost you to give us the freedom in you that you have given us. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Matthew 26 we read, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Please join in and sing the doxology, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the Church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.